everyone. Uh, I hope you enjoy your lunch and that you're ready for the afternoon session. Um, my name is Sofia and I'm a full stack team lead at Techipi, which recently changed its name to Overops. Um, uh, our product helps other developers understand why their code breaks in production. We're also doing some special ACA monitoring, so if you're interested uh, to hear more about it, just ask me later. Um, a bit more about myself. So I got my first job as an engineer when I was 16. Um, after that, I served a few years in the Army as a satellite operator. Then I studied for a bachelor degree and then master's degree in computer science. And for the past three and a half years, I've been working at Akipi. Um, over ops, sorry. Um, uh, during my master's, I dealt with some computer vision problems. Then I got familiar and interested in the fields of uh, machine learning and evolutionary algorithms. Um, and I found them very useful, uh, especially maybe on desperate moment when there was no other solution. Uh, so I'm here today to share this approach with you. Um, okay, let's start. So in 1859, uh, Charles Darwin published a book called The Origin of Species. And in this book, uh, it suggests the idea that organisms in nature are evolved by a series of minor changes. Um, and according to Darwin, uh, the natural selection is a key force that helps preserve good changes and eradicate bad ones. And so population became better and better over time, uh, thanks to the natural selection. And uh, we, we always, I think we always think of evolution as a long and protracted period. However, uh, this is not always so. So one of the first uh, documented and most famous cases of natural selection is uh, the case of the peppered moth, which is this thing that you can see in the picture. And before the industrial revolution in England, um, the peppered moth were mainly white, as you, uh, I don't have something to point with, but as you can see here, there. Um, and they blended uh, with the trees very well. Uh, and there was a minority of black peppered moth which was exposed and therefore more likely to be eaten by birds. Uh, but then come the, the Industrial Revolution and uh, together with the pollution and the trees turned dark. Uh, so the uh, white peppered moth become exposed and an easy prey for birds while the a minority of black peppered moths enjoy uh, the new camouflage ability uh, and live longer. And during a period of only 50 years, uh, the population, the relative part of the black pepper moth completely changed from 5% uh, to 98%. Um, I think it's crazy. And the question is now how can we utilize this power in order to uh, solve problems in computer science? So, uh, this is where genetic algorithms come into play. And genetic algorithms, uh, basically they mimic the process of evolution in nature uh, in order to solve problem. And more specifically, what we're trying to do is to uh, try to, thanks. Okay. Uh. Uh, so more specifically, what we're trying to do is to evolve some superior solution to a problem we're trying to solve. And so our population needs to be uh, some kind of, like a collection of possible solution uh, to the problem. So just to like to understand um, how this population uh, should look, uh, let's take um, a quick look at the traveling salesman problem. So I don't know uh, if you remember uh, this problem from uh, college, but uh, in this problem we have a list of cities and we need to find uh, the shortest route to visit each city uh, exactly once and then uh, come back to the place where we start from. So uh, a possible solution uh, to this problem is will look something like that. And it's, it is a route that uh, visits, it visits each city exactly once. 
Uh, and we can have like many uh, such solutions. Uh, some of them will be very bad and uh, uh, very long routes. Um, and we will try to find uh, uh, a good enough route, which is short enough. Um, okay, but like first thing first, uh, we need to first understand how we can model uh, the process of evolution uh, in computers. So first we need to start uh, with some population and we do it in, uh, in the initialization sta stage. And at this point, um, like in the TSP problem, um, the possible solution was some kind of roots. And here, uh, for the sake of simplicity, uh, we, we, we will work with uh, some with, with binary strings that will represent some solutions. Uh, so we need to, like, we will just generate random binary strings, and we call uh, these individuals. We call them chromosomes. So I'm going to to use this word a lot from now. Um, so we have our collection of chromosomes, which was uh, randomly initialized. And now what we want to do uh, is that we, w we want to actually apply the, apply the natural selection, which improve populations over time. So to do that, uh, we need first to understand uh, which are good chromosomes and which are like not that good. So we do it in the, fit, in the fitness stage uh, by applying a, fu a function called fitness function. And this function will get a chromosome, so it will get uh, binary strings, and it will return uh, some score, uh, representing how good this chromosome is. And so each chromosome will get some score. And now that we know uh, which is better, we can start and, and uh, do our uh, selection. And in the selection, what we want to do is to, first we need to, according to the fitness, we need to uh, give uh, the, these chromosomes some relative probability to be uh, selected in order to create uh, new children, uh, like in the evolution process. So uh, an easy way to do that is to, um, like to normalize the fitness to one, and then uh, if you sum like if you sum these values, you will get 20, and so the 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 probability that the first one will get will be two uh, two out of 20, um, and eight out of 20, and so on. And now that we have like probabilities, um, we can make a selection uh, which will give us. To, to parents and then we can move on uh, to the next stage uh, in order to create children. And the next stage is the crossover. So assuming we, we got these two uh, chromosomes uh, from, the, from the previous stage uh, when we like um, make some, uh, generate two random uh, values and, uh, uh, and got two parents, and now we want to find a way to recombine them. Yeah, in order to produce a child. So a simple way to do that will be to uh, like select some random cut point, which is this one in, in this case, and to take the first part from the first parent and the second part from the second parent. And then we will get uh, this chromosome, which is our new child, and together with other children created the same way, we'll form a new generation. And one last thing before we add it, uh, we add these children to the to the next generation, uh, will be to apply some mutation like happen in nature with a very low probability, um, and we will understand later why is it important. Um, but for now, what we can do is to just like go bit by bit, bit, and flip it with a very low probability. So here, for example, we, we got this chromosome. And then we have like a new population from all of these children created the same way. And we will do everything again and again. We will calculate fitness. We will give our probabilities according to the fitness. Uh, we will make selection. We will get pair of parents, create children, mutate them, and so on. 
and <laughs> we need to like to step at some point. We need uh, some termination criteria. So one thing we can do uh, is to stop maybe after uh, end generation or another thing uh, is to stop after some times and we will see later that it can run for a very long time. So this could be like a, reason, a reasonable um, criteria. And another thing we can do is to maybe set up some uh, fitness threshold and say that if one of the chromosomes reach that fitness, we can stop. This is good enough um, and we can stop. Um, but at the end, like we need one less time to calculate fitness for uh, each chromosome in the last generation and to mark like the best one and return it as the solution to the problem. Okay, so like this is how we, we model this process and let's see some simple example that, um, that, that do it to really, like, to really understand uh, how does it work. So in, in the low world problem, uh, what we're trying to do is to find some approximation to the hello world string. And if you, like this can be useful, for example, for autocorrect or something like that, when you, when you have some dictionary and a word that does not appear in, in the dictionary and you try to find the closest word. So we tried to, to find like a uh, close enough uh, uh, string. And the first thing is that we need to understand how to represent a chromosome, how a solution to the problem uh, looks. And here uh, we are talking about an ASCII string, so it will be simply ASCII strings of length of uh, 13. And now that we understand that, we can start with the evolution process. So um, just, like, just for the, the sake of like, simplicity and clarity, I shortened the, the chromosomes. Um, so first we need to initialize uh, the first population. Uh, we'll generate uh, random, binary, uh, random uh, ASCII strings. And so we will get maybe something like this. Um, and then we can move to the uh, fitness stage and uh, we need to evaluate uh, the chromosomes. So one way to do it here, and there are always many ways, so like you, have, you can be creative. So we can just count how many letters are in place. We know what our target string. So for example, here we know that like we see that the first two have two letters in place and the last one have one letter in place and so, so the, their fitness values will be uh, two, two and one. And now um, just like so you understand like, um, like the hello world problem is very simple but for example in the TSP problem uh, that we saw earlier uh, the way to calculate fitness, since we are looking for the shortest route, will be uh, to, to, like, to summarize the, the total uh, distance of the route. Um, okay, back to our problem. So we have our fitness value, we want to make a selection, we will do like we did before, we will get uh, 2 out of 5, 2 out of 5, 1 out of 5, and now we are moving to the crossover. Um, like before, very simple, we will take the first part from the first parent, last part from the second parent. Um, and one important thing he here is that we need to make sure that the produced ch child is, uh, is valid and it is still in the, like, is still a possible solution. So here it is kind of simple, but uh, again to the TSP problem, so you can't just do it. You can't just pick some random cut point and take the first part and the second part uh, because then you will get, um, here you will get DC, FC, DE, which is not a valid solution because it doesn't, it doesn't uh, make sure that you visit each city exactly once. 
Um, so like y you need to make sure that you know how to produce a valid uh, chromosome. Um, here, for example, uh, what you can do is to take the first part from the first parent and to take the rest of the cities and like in the same order they appear on the second parent. Um, but it really depends on the problem. And one last thing we need to do is to apply a mutation with a very, very low probability of maybe 0.001 or something very low. And uh, again, you need to make sure that uh, like the mutated child is still valid. Um, so back to the TSP problem. Um, like what, y you can't just uh, uh, change one, uh, one cell here because uh, you need to have each city exactly once. Uh, but you can maybe like switch to cities. Um, but apparently it doesn't work so well because like if you think about it, uh, s switching to cities break four connection between like four parts of the root. So here, for example, um, what you can do is like uh, to, to, to again to select a random cut point and reverse uh, the part that came after it. And this way, you keep most of the root the same. You only break one connection there between like right between the B and the F, and then we will get uh, this chromosome. So just like you just need to keep in mind that during these stages, you always are uh, uh, creating um, valid chromosomes. Um, so when I ran uh, the Hello World example on my computer and I printed uh, the most uh, fittest chromosome in each generation, I got the following output. And there are two interesting things here. So the first one, is that the fittest chromosome from generation 19 uh, is actually a recombination of the two fittest chromosome of generation uh, 15 and 18. So you can really see uh, that, uh, that the start of him is from generation 15 and the last from generation 18. And it, so this, this crossover uh, produces a better chromosome. Um, and another nice thing to see is that we, like, we got our result on generation 49, and we can see that uh, we got it by a uh, mutation uh, happened on the uh, fittest chromosome of generation 48. So I think it's nice to see that sometimes um, mutation can be good. And OK. So hopefully. Uh, like, if you have questions about the concept now, please ask me. Or is, is everything clear so far? Yeah? OK, cool. Um, so, OK, let's like dive into a bit more complex problem. Um, so in the evolving Mona Lisa problem, uh, what we are trying to do is to find some approximation to the original Mona Lisa. And we do that, we, like, we, we need to do that by using only 250 circles. Um, and this can be used, for example, for uh, compression, for thumbnails, and stuff like that. So we have 250, we are allowed to use only 250 circles, and each circle uh, has its own attribute. It has a location, um, which also has a z value because like the, the circles are overlapping, and it has a radius and color and alpha value. And so in order to represent a chromosome, we, we can use, um, uh, we can have a chromosome of length of 250, and each cell will contain um, such circle, and we'll have, uh, basically we'll have eight values representing uh, uh, the circle. So, uh, we can like we can calculate fitness by uh, comparing uh, like by rendering the chromosome into an image and then comparing the two pictures, 
and summarize uh, the difference between the pixels. And here we are, basically we want uh, lower fitness because it's a, like, it's a minimization problem. So we need to take that into account when we are uh, calculating uh, probabilities in the selection stage. Um, crossover can be done by taking uh, part of the circles from the first parent and part of them for the second parent. Uh, mutation can be done by maybe like go here and change some of the attribute with the very low probabilities. And okay, so here you can see uh, a group of chromosomes and you can see that in the first generation, uh, they are kind of random, um, maybe it looks more like modern art. And after a few minutes, uh, the chromosomes start taking shape. Uh, and from time to time, we can see that mutation occur. You can see there the colorful uh, circles. Uh, and it's good because it's helped us to avoid uh, premature convergence. Uh, because uh, if all the chromosomes will look the same pretty quickly, we will not have nothing to work with. And after uh, two and a half hours, we're starting to getting uh, a nice um, approximation. Um, I, I will not play all of this video, but like I will just so show you uh, small pieces of it so you can really see how does it start and you can see the like the flesh there which are uh, mutations and I will jump to the end uh, but at the end it's like the details starting to taking shape and I think it's cool uh, <laughs> but the thing is that this ran for almost seven days so it's a really, really long time. And we will talk in a moment um, about uh, some performance and how we can, uh, we can speed it a little bit. So, uh, I, sorry. OK, so you, you're probably trying to figure out why does it work. And like, it's a really difficult question. I don't have a good answer. Uh, I think nobody does. Uh, there are some theories about why exactly does it work. I don't have the time to get into it. So I will just try to uh, give you some intuitive explanation. Um, so uh, if you think of our search space, uh, of the problem search space, we have like many, many hills, we try to find our uh, global maximum and don't stack on some uh, local maximum. So on the one hand, we want to uh, find as many hills as possible, but on the other end, we want to climb, climb up, up the hills. And we achieve that by uh, using mutation, crossover, and selection. Um, Mutation basically encourage diversity and spread the chromosome all over the space, while uh, selection and crossover um, encourage homogeneity by uh, mating the top performing uh, chromosomes uh, with uh, higher probabilities. So, like all of this is, is, is driven by the fitness and at, at the end, uh, what matters is that in practice it works, believe me. And uh, I, I think that, that this is what matters. So, okay. When we come into implementation, um, there are two main things to consider. And the first one is performance, and the second one is memory. So, as I said, genetic algorithms can run for a really, really long time. Uh, in the Mona Lisa, it ran for seven days. Uh, at NASA, they tried to develop antenna, um, and it took them uh, uh, about a month to, to design it. Um, it looks something like that. 
and you can see that it's not something that a human uh, would think of. Uh, this, this is actually not the final antenna that they used in real, but this is one of the uh, antennas that created. And it took all, almost a month, so it's, uh, it's crazy. And we need to understand how we can uh, reduce uh, the time. So we can, uh, one thing we can do, uh, we need to, uh, we, we need to distribute uh, the, the algorithm in some way. So one way to do that is to use a master-slave architecture. And uh, we will need to use, we can use some actors here. We, we can have an, like uh, our main actor, which will be the, the evolving uh, actor. And we will have a, a crossover actor and mutation actor. We will, be, we will do uh, this job and like the heaviest part uh, in genetic algorithms is usually uh, the fitness calculation. So what we can do here uh, is that our master will run most of the algorithm. And it will use uh, the slaves only for the fitness calculation. So uh, he will send them uh, the chromosome, they will calculate fitness, um, and the master could continue working. And we can do that by, uh, uh, by ACA cluster, by using ACA cluster. Uh, it is very like, clean and nice. So uh, this is one way, but the thing is that first we are limited by our uh, slowest uh, slave. So it's a bit of a problem. And the second thing, thing is that um, sometimes the fitness calculation uh, is depended uh, of, of one chromosome is dependent on the other chromosomes. So for example, if you're trying to find some uh, strategy for, some, for maybe to work scissor paper, uh, so the way to calculate fitness is by letting your chromosomes play against each other and give them uh, one point for, like, for each winning. So you can do that this way, uh, but it's a, bit, it's a bit more complex. So a better way to do that is to use uh, architecture of, uh, of, a, of a cluster of nodes, uh, which all have, have uh, the same responsibility. So we will have here um, uh, as many machines as we have, and each of them will run its own genetic algorithm, so it will develop its own population, subpopulation. And from time to time, uh, it could maybe after a few seconds or after a few generations, um, we will add a stage called migration, and in this stage, uh, each, uh, each uh, machine will broadcast uh, the best chromosomes so far to the other machines. And so uh, the population will basically evolve um, uh, in, some, uh, in their environment, but they will enjoy the results of other uh, populations. Uh, and it's actually pretty similar to what happened in nature because uh, there are always, there are some geographical, um, not restriction, but limits that, uh, and usually populations uh, um, evolving like in the same area. And so again, we, we, we can use here um, uh, ACA cluster. We need to use uh, routers uh, to broadcast the message. Um, I will, when I upload the, the, the presentation, I will also put the code there. Um, okay. So another important thing to do uh, is to consider memory because what we are actually doing here is to generate like tons of objects uh, with a very, uh, that live like very short life. So, we have uh, maybe dozens, dozens to hundreds of chromosomes, and each of them changed uh, in the crossover in the, and in the mutation, and they ran for maybe thousands or hundreds of thousands of generations. And like all the objects created here uh, just uh, live for a very short time and then just died. So to, I'm going to show you something that like will demonstrate um, what's really happening when a genetic algorithm is running. So, 
Uh, first, uh, just like a, a quick uh, description of the uh, garbage collector um, structure. So I'm not going to get into details, but in general, uh, the garbage collector of the JVM has uh, three um, main uh, areas. The first one is the young generation, which consists itself from the uh, Eden space and the survivors space. Um, and objects, uh, usually objects crea created uh, in this part uh, of the memory. And if they are survive until the next uh, garbage collection, they are moving uh, to the, um, first they move to the survival area in the young generation. And if they uh, survive for another garbage collection, then they move to the old generation and stay there. And we also have our uh, permanent area, uh, which was the, like the perm, the perm gen, uh, and now is called the metaspace in Java 8. So uh, one more thing you can see with Visual VM is the uh, is the uh, heap uh, graph. So you can see that uh, the data, the memory uh, increased, uh, but every once in a while uh, there is a like some kind of a cliff, and uh, it happened when a, a garbage collection occur. And again, this is for uh, normal apps. Uh, this is how it looks for genetic algorithms. It's, it's crazy. Uh, OK. So um, there are, like, I try to uh, find some libraries written in Scala. There are no, unfortunately. If someone here will do that, it will be great. Um, there are two good libraries written in Java, uh, Genetics.io and G JGAP, um, which both are very good and very easy to start with. Um, Genetics.io, it's a bit more modern. Uh, it's, uh, it uses uh, Java 8 streams. Um, so it probably will be a better choice if you already moved to Scala 2.12. Um, another resource would be the book uh, called Scala for Machine Learning by Patrick Nicholas. Uh, this link is actually a link to the uh, source code, for, like the source code appear in the book, and it also uh, contains some basic implementation for genetic algorithm in Scala. So you can take a look at that. And there is the talk of being creative with genetic algorithms and type classes uh, by uh, Noel Markham. I don't see him. Yeah. Hey. Uh, which is awesome. I watch it on YouTube. Uh, and it's really. Thank you. Um, <laughs> I'm embarrassed. Um, one last thing. Um, hopefully. Now all you want to do is just like to go home and uh, you have this problem you always wanted to solve and you just want to uh, start coding it. So there are two uh, main things you need to ask yourself in order to identify if this problem um, is a good candidate for a genetic algorithm. So first, uh, you need to understand um, how you uh, represent a solution to the problem. Uh, because y you need to start with like some chromosomes. And uh, the second thing is that you need to be able to evaluate um, how good each solution is. Uh, and like you must have these two. And also regarding the fitness function, you really need uh, a good fitness function that like a binary fitness function will not work. You can't like you really need a number that represents how good each chromosome is. And in general, um, like this is the two uh, uh, key points. But in general, uh, genetic algorithms are really good with um, for for optimization problem, uh, for multi-objective problem for problems where you don't really may be familiar with the domain, like in the NASA antenna, you don't understand the physics construction. You do know how a solution should look like. Uh, same, from the Mona, same from the Mona Lisa, you don't really have to understand uh, compression algorithms, but you know how you want your, like, the final solution uh, will look like. Um, 
and uh, I think it's like uh, in use also uh, in uh, a lot of on in, in engineering and uh, a lot for multi-objective uh, problems, as I said. Um, okay, I think this is basically it. What? Which, what, what exactly in cars? <laughs> uh, okay, I'm done. Uh, if you have questions now, um, I'd be happy to try and answer them. So when you implemented that, which language did you use? So I, I'm embarrassed to say that uh, when, when I, it was a, uh, a bit uh, uh, about a, uh, a year ago when I uh, wrote uh, my last uh, genetic algorithm, so I, I used Java back then, yeah. But it doesn't really matter, it's really a concept, so um, it's it really, like the language doesn't really matter, you just, you, you do need to understand the technical uh, problem, like with the JVM and, and with objects and stuff like that, but it's a general concept. Okay, so my question is, uh, did you try to uh, implement this uh, genetic algorithm in some uh, maybe other language? And also, what was your uh, speed up when you uh, used the cluster on Arca? It was worth it to uh, distribute this? Or maybe if you just put it to C++, maybe it would be uh, faster? I, I didn't get the whole uh, second question. Can you repeat it, please? Okay, so the first question is uh, about so using other language and also compare using the second one, uh, using this uh, other language, how it compares to the uh, ACA and clustering. How much speed up do you get when you are using the clustering? Yes, so I did use, uh, also a long time ago, I did uh, use uh, C++ for that. Um, I never compared uh, a language to see which perform better. Uh, I, I, again, I really think it depends on the way you implement it and take into account your, like the language uh, restrictions. Um, in a cluster, you know, it, like uh, yeah, in the second uh, architecture I saw of, uh, of a cluster with nodes, equal nodes, um, so it will, you have a, like a little bit of uh, slowness maybe because uh, each, uh, each machine have like its own population so they not fully enjoy uh, the other populations uh, comparing to using like a really strong machine uh, with tons of memory that ran it all uh, uh, by its own. But basically uh, it will be, you know, the speed up will be uh, in correlated, uh, correlated to the uh, number of machine you use. It, it's like, it's quite simple, I think. I have a question for this uh, data about the garbage collection. It's like for me, it seems that there were like a lot of going to the EM. A lot so of? Yeah, a lot of objects going to the EM because if I like get the, 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 the algorithms correctly, there's like a lot of object created and then like trash away. And it's pretty common to like a normal Scala application because we created a lot of, let's say, double columns that represent lists. lists. And I, for Scala application, I never seen this kind of uh, garbage collection time. So my question is maybe did you try to like play with, I don't know, even, si even size or any facts to the JVM? No, so I, I, I tried I tried to uh, to control the, the heap size. Um, you just get it like, um, you get the same uh, effect, but maybe uh, quick, quicker or, but I think that like, of course, also in Scala objects created uh, and, but the thing is that here, um, like it's really just, you create an object and it just immediately die. You don't have like almost anything that uh, stay uh, during the process. It's it just uh, used for a few milliseconds and then it's die. So 
Um, but uh, one interesting thing that uh, I didn't manage to do before the talk, but I want to check, maybe I will publish the result, is to try to, uh, uh, to, is to implement it like, uh, like uh, using mostly a mutable list and, uh, and, and using mostly immutable list and then compare it. So I think it's, it's really interesting to check this thing. Um, it's, a, it's a bit of a selfish question. Um, so, uh, when I when I did this talk um, uh, for the genetic algorithms, the thing that really killed it for me um, was the fitness function on comparing images. And well, you, I, I gave up after three days, so nice one for lasting seven. Um, but could you just talk a bit about how you how you compare the images and, and the kind of fitness function you used for that? You asking about the Mona Lisa? Yeah. Yeah. So, um, like, like, I I didn't run this example. Is uh, I found it online. I didn't uh, implement it by myself. Um, but like, I would start probably with, as I said, to uh, uh, summarize all the differences between uh, the two images and uh, the like. You can you can do some sparse fitness uh, evaluation and maybe to uh, try to check to to you know also check some parts of the image to get some an idea of how good is your chromosome and we can think more about it later. Sure. Uh, uh, when you use this computational cluster and uh, uh, machines exchange their chromosomes, the best ones, then basically all of the machines at one point get the same uh, generation. So they're starting from the same place. Wouldn't it be better if you had more uh, variability between them? Because then you have to wait for to happen in order to have different generations and different. So. Um, each, it's, each machine has its own uh, population and it only gets uh, a few chromosomes uh, every once in a while and it adds them to the, to the current population but it's still, and uh, the new chromosomes help you know, to evolve uh, its subpopulation but it's still uh, running its own algorithm. So it's not that the, there is not, no point where all the population uh, are the same. It's okay. Okay. Uh, thank you. <laughs>